Welcome to the Modern CPA Success Show, the podcast dedicated to helping accounting firms stay ahead of the curve. Our mission is to provide you with the latest and greatest insights on cutting edge tools, innovative marketing strategies, virtual CFO services, and alternative billing methods. Join us as we change the way people think about accounting. Hey Adam, how are you today? Doing really good, how about you? Doing well, I, I think people are gonna be excited about this uh, with Corey Gaiman, this episode that we're about to do. Any initial thoughts that people should be listening for? Yeah, I think it's just interesting because um, we talk about marketing and picking up clients and doing all those kind of things. What we don't hear a whole lot about at a smaller level anymore are acquisitions. And Corey yeah. has a lot of experience acquiring small tax practices. I know he's just kind of on the cusp of developing the advisory piece, but I think there's a lot of lessons learned if you do want to start acquiring businesses. You know, he's he's got a lot of experience and he, he shared a lot of great details with us. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And he really did get into some good detail around kind of early things, what he did, lessons, kind of managing the team, what it looks like for the person who's selling and sticking around common processes. He had a lot of nuggets in there that I think people are really going to enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. Let's jump in and, and see what he has to say. Sounds great. Welcome to this episode of the Modern CPA Success Show. Um, I can already tell from kind of the pre-discussion that we have with our guests, this is going to be a really fun episode to have in here. I'm Tom Waddleton. Um, I work for Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. Um, I'm co-hosting today and my usual co-host is here, Adam Hale. And Adam co-founded Summit CPA Group and now runs that practice for the Summit Virtual CFO by Anders. Adam, welcome today. Thanks, Tom. Glad to be here. Corey Gaiman is our guest today, and Corey started JCG CPA Firm. Um, Corey, welcome today. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Would love to hear at the beginning, just tell us a little bit about your practice and you and your background, and then we'll jump in and get to some of the topics. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I, I got my start in a small firm like mine, uh, you know, tax focus and bookkeeping focus, working with smaller clients. Uh, worked there for seven years, uh, decided to move back home and start my firm in a small town. So um, kind of went from there. That was nine years ago this July. Mm -hmm. So we're nine years in now. And I've grown that just one small office. It was just me at that time. Grown it to almost 40 employees and we're across seven offices now. Uh, just through acquisition, natural growth, and and getting good people to, to move us forward. So we moved into, uh, we're in seven different cities. That's cool. Let's talk a little bit about team. Would love, you know, it's a common yeah. buzzword and I wonder about your experience. Like, Short of, shortage of CPAs. Are you, oh you, my you conquered that and you're here to give us the <laughs> solutions? Are you dealing with uh, that? Where are you with that? Fighting it daily? Uh, maybe not okay, necessarily sure. conquered quite yet. Uh, I, I was lucky. I ran into an, an excellent uh, CPA this last fall um, mm -hmm. that has joined my team. He's, he's become, you know, a great asset to the team. Um, before him, I have picked up along the way when I could. Some have been through acquisition, but most of those are wanting to retire, of course. So they're around for a couple of years. Uh, we have several in training right now within the firm um, that are hoping to move toward their CPA or even EA just, just for uh -huh. what we do. And EA is very valuable as well. Um, I, it's hard to find somebody that wants to, to get a CPA license right now. It seems like, you know, they've been declining every year, they say for 21 years now. Right. And, uh, I don't know if it's difficulty. I don't know if it's they don't feel like they don't need it. Uh, I don't know if the hours, you know, there's a lot of theories out there of why people shied away from it. But we're we're trying to promote the industry, trying to promote the profession, um, mm -hmm. trying to to encourage our staff and uh, students that I run into, encourage them that this this license will take you a long way, with or without our firm, even if you're private or, or in a separate arena um, that this license is a good license to have but yeah it seems like we have to sell it to people we're yeah. <laughs> selling people on it right now so it's something I, I, we're all battling sure so i can see where you know you're coming from uh definitely an advocate of the cpa license oh, talk to us a little bit about the services you provide your clients like what are the core services and do you see there's a difference because CAS obviously is coming on pretty strong and I too used to be a huge advocate of like everybody has to have their CPA license right. it's an integrity right. a credibility kind of a thing right. um, and then just over time just especially on the advisory side of the firm right. I've just 
noticed there's some really good people in industry, maybe with MBAs or things of that nature. Absolutely. So I've kind of, I've changed my tune just a little bit, but yeah. talk to me about, um, talk to me about like what those services are. And if, if you do have kind of, sure you know, a different point of view on, you know, depending and, on. And I don't fully disagree with you. And I don't fully disagree with the ones that decide not to get it and choose a different path. Um, one of the things that we battle, and this is slightly off the topic of your question, but it's, it's the boards, it's the state boards, this, the requirements they put in place and you must have a CPA at that location and it must be a certificated person, um, certified person. So that, the law is not catching up to the reality of the experience that people can gain just from work. Um, they come in and they can work five years and they can almost do everything I, a CPA can do at my office. And let's just be honest. It's, just, it's the same for me. I did ob obtain it. I do promote it. I do need it. I think it can take people further. But you're right. With the tools that we have now, it, you could still make a good living without it. Um, yeah. One of my selling points is that you you have a ceiling in that case, unless you're just a driven entrepreneurial person and you, you move that forward. Uh, maybe you don't have a ceiling, but that CPA license in the private practice, in the public world, in management, um, there's really no ceiling. You can you can continue to go up and up. Um, so that would be my, my promotion of it still in light of what you said. But I don't I don't fully disagree with you. There are a lot of services that can be done without it. The enrolled agent license or certificate it has become very valuable. Um, the credibility that it brings from the public is really what those letters are, are giving you. However, five years tax experience, 20 years tax experience, 30 years even. Sure. That's that's really what matters. Well, I mean, that's that's really end of the day what matters. In our practice, we focus on uh, tax. That that would be the core of what we every all the other services surround. So we help people with tax returns, business tax returns, complicated real estate style tax returns, and of course, individuals during tax season. Um, from that base, we build outward, sometimes it's bookkeeping services, tax services, or um, payroll services, uh, stayed away from audit. That seems to have diverged and the bigger firms can take care of audit. We'll, we'll stay away from that arena for a while. <laughs> Yeah, we're with you there. So, okay. So it sounds like, especially I would say that, you know, in audit, in tax, I agree. Like the CPA seems to be kind of the, right. the, the way to be there for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah. Yeah. So if, and none of us have, but you admitted, so you haven't totally conquered getting yeah. everyone that you want. So what are some of the strategies you've employed? You've mm -hmm. still got clients, you still want to get work done, but you can't just right. flip on the spigot and get more CPAs whenever you want them. Exactly. You know, we uh, it, it we've had to hire recruiters. We've had to put ads out that can get rather expensive. Unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. we've had to be more enticing and make our place a, a better place to work. Um, there's a lot of competition out there as far as you know what services are you offering your employees, uh, and what perks are you offering them. What here the basis that I've always tried to build the firm on with my employees is a good work life balance. And I know that's mm -hmm. been a buzzword for a while, but it's true and there's not a better way to say it. Uh, I want my employees to get their jobs done, but I want them to have a home life. I have a family, yeah. I have three small kids and I, I don't want to miss their childhood and I don't want any of my employees to either. Um, in the very beginning, I, I told everyone I hired, I said, look, I, at this time, I, this is all I can pay you. And maybe you can find more somewhere else, but I, mm -hmm. can, I can let you off for every ball game. I can make sure that you're home for your kids later. Um, I can make sure that if something comes up, you just tell me what's going on and you go take care of your family. Because to me, family is most important. And, and I've tried to really promote that and push that. Uh, a lot of, one of the big black eyes that our profession has is the all go, no quit. You have to work till midnight. You work through the night during tax season. I mean, this generation doesn't want that. My generation, I don't think anybody wants sure. that anymore. Sure. Right. With just, just doing this conversation that we are here, shows us there are better ways to get these jobs done. We can yeah. do them virtually. Someone can work from home. There's better ways to do it. So I've really tried to create that culture and that atmosphere. And lately, you know, over the past 18 months, we've seen some success from that to get some good employees that want to work with us, want to have that flexibility. Um, and it's working so far. So I, I believe that's the continued route to get some good talent. Yeah. It's the how part of that is something I'd love to dig into some because we've emphasized a lot around things like streamlining processes and efficiencies. 
I'd be interested in that because it, it, you know it's one thing to tell the team to do that, but are are there some yeah. things you've done that you say, okay, this works really well to allow someone to actually leave and not have the work falling apart or totally dependent on that one right. person? Right. So we we do some cross training, and I know that's a traditional tactic. Mm-hmm. Um, I do want more than one person to be able to handle a client. Um, I, I mentioned that we had seven offices. We try to make the processes at each office basically the same, mm-hmm. and we utilize an online server. And so with that online mm-hmm. server. It doesn't matter if they're 300 miles away, they're effectively down the street or down the hall. Uh, you know, we can, any of my employees can jump into any client and take care of the process, take care of the task that needs done. So if I've got someone that gets sick or has a funeral or has something that they need to be gone for, our, our uh, work can still get done. Our clients can still be taken care of. So have you looked into, you know, keep coming back to the shortage and the process and all that stuff? Have you done anything with um, offshoring or what's your take on that? Have you explored that? So I get asked about it all the time uh, by salespeople, of course. Um, sure. I've also heard from many clients that I have taken on how much they dislike that. Uh, so no, no, I mm-hmm. do not. I don't want to do offshoring. I would prefer to keep everything very local. I would prefer that when someone calls in, they're talking to a person at one of our offices. Um, and I don't like the idea of the data moving somewhere that I can't fully control. Uh, obviously, that's a that's a very big deal in our profession. And, you know, let's wrap that back to why a CPA is necessary. There, there are reasons why having that certificate and having that board matter. And one of those is the ethics, it's the confidentiality, it's the privacy. Um, a lot of people feel more secure about those things when they see the CPA firm or the CPA license because we have a board that regulates it. That's just another one of those pieces. Uh, I had a client come to me a few years ago and his his accountant told him, hey, I offshored all this data entry and he charged him for it at his rates. And he was furious. He said, hmm. That's, that doesn't make any sense. I don't want my stuff going anywhere and I want you to do it and I want it to be done locally. And why are you charging your rates? And I know you paid them nothing that, you know, that was just the client's take on it. But it, it kind of led me to see that I don't know that, that that that's a realm I want to get into just yet. So okay. I, and I and I want to create jobs right here. And like the towns that I'm in, most of them are small. I'm from a small town, you know, 3,500 people. It's where I was born and raised and that's where I moved back to to start this. And I want to create those jobs for people in those towns. Sounds like the beginning of like a John Mellencamp song. Sorry, Tom and I, Tom and I are from Indiana. So, <laughs> yeah, there you um, go. So, so we get that. Out um, Southwest Missouri, not much different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Elevate your firm with a virtual CFO playbook, how to land $60,000 per year clients and provide a killer client experience. This comprehensive online series of modules provides you with the essential tools to create and deliver scalable VCFO services. Developed from Summit's successful approach, which propelled them from $500,000 to over $10 million in revenue in 10 years, this playbook will equip you with the skills to take your firm to the next level. Additionally, upon completion, you can receive 24 hours of CPE credit for the course. Ready to grow your firm? Enroll now at vcfoplaybook.summitcpa.net. A little bit of a def- another take, and I'd love to hear your your thought on that because I've heard many people say that we do leverage offshore um, capabilities mm-hmm. for many of the things that our team members don't want to do, and it's things like clearing an inbox of invoices that have to get coded using certain rules and yeah. maybe some reconciliations with a lot of intent on what are people allowed to see and do, and we do have a lot of those mm-hmm. controls in place, and we choose not to have our clients interact directly with that team that they're that support team. That's one of the ways that we've helped take a CPA and say, okay, we want you doing some of the things that CPA is doing, reviewing someone else's work right. for that. And I just wonder if you've had some of those thoughts and not to judge your decision you made, but I, I think we yeah. found a lot of value without some of those risks in there or managing the risks. Yeah. And, and, and potentially I, I saw the feedback from the, from the front line and didn't, didn't dig in anymore uh, to see how to solve those problems um, because I hadn't quite got to that point where it was necessary yet. Um, I worry, and I think every one of us do, about the, the cost of labor here, and I worry uh-huh. that that could continue to force professional services offshore like that. Um, that that could be something that I dig into further in the future, but at this time, sure. I, I've found enough good people and, and been able to keep costs in control that we could, we could do it local, and I'd rather do that 
Um, these are my my friends and and people that I get to know sure. and I see and I I know their families and I care about them and and so I that team aspect that family aspect of our firm I I'd hate for that to go away or feel like it was cheapened. Yeah, yeah. I think for us, I think you know going back to what Tom said, it was less probably about the cost for us and it's more. Because in some instances, I don't know that you save a terrible amount of money because you got to, mm-hmm. you know, you got to put a point person in there. You right. do have the additional security. You know, I would say our security probably internationally is probably tighter than probably. You know, U.S. <laughs> security. Yes. Yeah. Um, but the but the other thing was, is just whenever you were talking about before quality of work, what we're finding is like the young professionals, they don't want to enter bills. They yeah. don't want to, you know, and then, yeah. and so, and so what we looked at is the stuff that number one is just kind of a training point for them that they don't want to necessarily do. doesn't mean we don't have them do it right away right. and then but quickly move them out of it. But also we were looking for areas where I don't want to necessarily build out a stateside bookkeeping team that in mm-hmm. all reality will probably disappear due to AI and technology maybe in the next you know what I mean? Like even mm-hmm. doing tax returns, like yeah. mm-hmm. preparing tax returns will likely, um, it, it's it's probably in our near future that that yeah. will go away, either right. through reform or through automation or something. You know, the, the majority of the preparation work is going to be right. gone. And then how do we justify our, which is why a lot of firms are moving more into the advisory space. So have you started to leverage, you know, your tax services mm-hmm. and and bill for those and build that advisory service into your mm-hmm. into your tax practice? So I'd say we're on the cusp of that uh, since we are so tax focused and, and I've acquired firms each year along the way here. So there's a lot of uh, a lot of to do when you acquire a firm, of course, and to get things oh, straightened yeah. out, streamlined. Um, but to the, your to your AI point, I obviously I mean, we all see that coming um, yeah. and and. I, I view I view technology as I always have with going back to you know cotton gin and the plow right it, it you just find a way to work with it you find a way right. to use it it's a new tool that you get to have and so I don't see that as a bad thing at all um, and our uh, bookkeeping team is probably the first one affected but potentially now one person can do the, the triple the clients if they're utilizing right. the AI mm-hmm. that that's the way I view it. And I view it as as making our growth almost just unlimited, uh, the potential for it. So uh, at this time, you know, our bookkeeping team we try to keep it in check on how many people we have. But here along the way, we've you know we've used QuickBooks Online for quite a while, and there's been mm-hmm. AI ish you know services inside there yep. already with the downloading of the bank transactions and the, how it will code them for you. So we've already been getting up to speed on that, and and honestly, recently I've hired quite a few twenty and under. And they, they, they're already grown up with this stuff. They are already, it's, it's natural to them to just work with it, to get it in place. You know, it's almost like coding or, or something of the sort. So I, I'm seeing that coming and I'm trying to make sure that we are hiring people that fit with that and, and we'll move forward with that. Well, I think it was interesting too, just kind of shifting gears. I, you know, you said you have seven locations. Obviously, mm-hmm. there's a lot with the mergers and acquisition pieces mm-hmm. that we were fully distributed, so we didn't have any brick and mortar right. um, for about the last ten years. But there was a transition period there where we had like half the team in the office, half the team yeah. out of the office. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now that we've merged with Anders, now we have we kind of went back to that where we have like right. maybe maybe like twenty percent of our team is in an office at least two or three days a week Mm -hmm. and just managing that cultural differences. So can you talk to us about like your experience managing seven locations? I don't know if you have fully (laughs) remote people on top of that Mm -hmm. as well, but just trying to, you know, how do you pull that culture together? You know, obviously the system and processes, you know, the technology is important, but how do you do that from a cultural perspective? So uh, several of them have been acquisitions, right? So I, from ground up, I've only done, Three. The rest were acquisitions. So what we battle there is what is the culture already when you acquire it? Mm-hmm. Um, is it good or bad? And what can we learn from it for the rest of our team? And then trying to get someone in there that understands the way I want it to be and to kind of start to morph it slowly. So, there, you know, it comes down to having a leader at each location, a physically present leader. Mm-hmm. And that does lend back to the board and the CPA and, and who's going to be in there. And they, they become the leader effectively. Um, we've, we've really tried to keep it consistent across the firm yet 
allow each office to have its own nuance, have its own microculture, if you will, um, while maintaining a larger culture and a larger uh, theme of what our office is. Um, I, I'm probably the glue that ties that together. Uh, I, I visit them as much as I can. I, I stay in communication. Um, I have gotten to where I'm pulling away from this, so much uh, actual task work and more building of this culture. And, and it is something that I take a lot of pride in and want to um, excel at and want to um, promote a great place for our employees to work. But then we also have the remote employees. Like you mentioned, we do have a few that are fully remote. Um, we, I mentioned that we have an online server. Well, that means we have that tied in communication as well. Also, we are utilizing Teams and everybody stays in communication on Teams and we're able to, to easily chat back and forth, get on the phone if we need to. Uh, and this year, I think we're planning a, either this year or next year, we're planning a big get together and we're trying to get together once or twice a year and pull everyone together. So at the moment, we're not too far away to make that cumbersome, but as we continue to grow, uh, I know that'll be a bigger and bigger event, but Still, I think getting everybody together face to face once in a while, great thing to do. Just to yeah. put a face with the, the voice. I'd love to hear more about those. We do similar in being an entirely remote team. That's one mm -hmm. of the important things. Um, so we've done a retreat early in May. We did a retreat on Arizona and we're doing another one for the division in October. Awesome. In Arizona, Adam was at about 90 people. Is that about right for the whole team? Uh -huh. 75 people, something like that? I think we, well, we had some support staff there. I think we had a little, yeah. I, we might've been a little more than a hundred people and there. Employees, employees only. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, so, oh, yeah. so we yeah. do. Yeah. So what we typically do with the retreats is uh, it's really important for it to be employees only for, yeah. you know, the couple days. And then we mix in some fun. We start out late mm -hmm. um, yeah. and then we'll mix in some fun there. But on the closing dinner, that's where we allow like spouses to come yeah. and then they can extend their stay. So if they want to extend uh, their yeah. stay and use our rates or whatever to, you know, bring the family right. in and, and hang out, then that's cool. So we've always done that. Just if, if you have the whole family come, I mean, yeah. don't get me wrong. If it's a small, yeah, well, it's a lot of people. And if it's a small group, it's okay. Yeah. Um, but whenever you start to get into your bigger company, then it becomes a little bit more difficult because the idea is you want, you know, you don't want them to like click up or have to like stay around their yep. family. You want them to yep. really like come together. So, yeah. Um, so, and we've always brought an outside facilitator, you know, mm -hmm. for one of those things. Okay. And then probably yeah. one of the other things that we've done that's uh, that way we can be participants, right? Um, right? As opposed to just running the show. And then we also have a, um, and happy to introduce you to her. She's, uh, yeah. she's been amazing for us, but she plans all of our retreats. So oh, she puts wow. the, like, yeah. she helps us like make sure like all the print materials there. She does the hotels. Right. She does. I mean, she coordinates, make sure all the flights are going. I mean, it's, it's been really, she's it's instrumental so that again, so that, yeah, the team's well supported, but from a leadership standpoint, we can be participants in our own, in our own retreat, right. which makes and, a big difference. And I think that's really important too. And, and we're, we're on the, uh, we are just now starting these, uh, to be honest, you know, we've done a, a couple where we've, we've gotten together with, when it made sense, COVID was happening. And so we were, sure. it didn't make sense at that point. And several of my retirees uh, went on out through that, through the COVID era, if we're calling it that. Mm. And, and they weren't able to be part of anything that we do. So we're, we're hoping to have maybe in the fall, have some sort of boot camp training retreat, like you just kind of described. Uh, and then maybe in the summer, a different time of the year, have to where it is all families as well. And we're all close enough. We can drive in and. Uh, oh, great. It, it, you know, maybe we do a couple of days. We have to figure out lodgings. All towns don't always have a hotel. So, sure. <laughs> uh, but, but we're on the cusp of doing that. And I hired um, uh, my marketing director this, this year. Her name's Melanie. And she does a great job at putting these things together. And, and she's really pushed me forward and saying, hey, these things are important. We got to make sure we're doing this for our employees. Let's get them together. That's what they want. And um, trying to make those things happen. You said you're in Missouri. I, I hear Branson yeah. probably for that family. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> probably. Yeah. We, we have an office in Springfield, just north of Branson. So <laughs> there you go. You're already set. <laughs> right. How much do so the team members who work in locations, is there any kind of working between, do you have people who work sometimes in different offices or is it pretty well set that if this is my office, this is kind of my only home? So, so yes, yeah, so we have a few that, that might move around, but really it's more of a leadership in those, I have myself and, and the other CP I hired in the fall named Newman. He, we travel to the different offices a little bit. Okay. Um, but when they're there, 
they can work on any client because they're all on the server. So sure. they don't have to leave. They don't have to leave their office and they can still assist the other office. That, that's really nice. the beauty of how this server is played out. Uh, and my first acquisition, I got hooked up with his IT guy and he pushed me on this idea. He said, this is the way to go. If you want to grow big and you want people to help each other, that's the way to go. So mm -hmm. I can hire in a small town that doesn't have a lot of demand for our services. I can hire people to, to be there with me in that office and they can work on any offices. Clients. Nice. And that's that's really opened the, the doors up for us to to work with people all over the country. And there's just no limitations anymore. And, and we can push our push out there what we want to do, um, how we want to work with them. And as long as they're on board with it, and they'll submit documents electronically. They'll you know, allow us to collaborate with their QuickBooks online, whatever we need to do. Um, we have clients we never meet and we have employees to don't meet each other unless we do these two retreats because, yeah, they're not moving around really at all. OK. Okay. So, so you've moved a lot of your tax practice and stuff to being able to do virtual. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're still, you still have your locations and you want your yeah. team to still be in person, but your clients aren't really showing up every day. There's, uh, you know, there's not right. 20 people sitting in your lobby waiting to so get tax I, returns knocked out. When I started the firm, just me, right. That was the goal. That, that was the, that was the model. I, you know, drop it off. Or let's do this online thing. It was nine years ago, so it was still relatively new. And you guys know this. In rural communities, they're still another 15 years behind, usually, 10 to 15 years. <laughs> and just their thought process on everything. So it was very new to them. But I've always pushed for, yes, let's, let's get this online delivery set up. And along the way, we have improved that process. And now it's really efficient. You know, finished tax return, I save it on our server. And we put it in their portal. They're e-signing. They're paying us online done in five minutes instead of showing up, you know, hopefully they review it first, but done in five minutes instead of showing up the sure. office, waiting in line and yeah. uh, doing that whole process. As I've acquired, uh, some have, have already had that in place. Some haven't. Uh, it, obviously it's very generational uh, with the clients mm -hmm. and some are, you know, might demand a meeting and we just, we try to ease those transitions because we want to, maintain the legacy of our retiree and the practice they built. Uh, we do care about the clients, but we want to try to show them new options. And it's mm -hmm. amazing how many times a client says, oh, well, I didn't know I could do it that way. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I could just drop it off. I didn't know I could take pictures and with this with my phone and upload it to this portal that you have. I, you know, they just didn't even know there was another way to do it. So yeah. we are not only becoming more efficient ourselves, we're making our clients' lives more efficient with this process also. That's great. Can can you, uh, I mean, for, for the folks listening that are thinking about, because this comes up a lot, like yeah, I heard you say that you hired a marketing director right. and those kind of things. It's always comes down to like, hey, where do we find these customers? How are we, yeah. you know, how, how are we locating these people? Do you do it through niche and you go national, that kind of stuff. Um, but but even more so, you've, you've chosen probably a, a more unique, I would say, a while back traditional approach of acquiring firms. Mm -hmm. You don't mm -hmm. see that as much anymore. Um, can you talk to us about like that journey and what you look for and what you really stay away, like when you yeah. know to run the other direction <laughs> for anybody right. that's like right. fed up with it going, Hey, I want to, instead of organic growth, I right. need a certain leverage piece here and I am right. okay with acquiring a couple firms. Can you tell us, you know, kind of the do's and don'ts there? Sure. Uh, so most of the firms I've acquired have been through a word of mouth referral, um, known of a, or. A few of them, I already knew them, or I just showed up at their office. Uh, the very first one, I just put a business card in his in his slot and I said, give me a call. And he did. And, and we, we hit it off. <laughs> he, he had a bad day and grabbed that card and called <laughs> yeah. you. Huh? Hey, yeah. When you do it in April, and they call. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I mean, he's everything. But Love it. it, it I, mean, I continue to get an H&R Block uh, notice every April 20th. Yeah, you know, is this the last year? You're ready to sell? So, But no, yeah. the, the process is the, the person is really important. Um, the person that's running that office and the team they have in place, that, that's what's important. The people are what's important and the processes they have in place. I have acquired a few that had extremely old processes. I've acquired some that have a more digital processes like we already had. And they both have their challenges and they both have um, their, their pros. Uh, you know, some of those old practices, they still work, but they're inefficient. And so we want to get them all up to date. So sometimes that is pretty painful. So through the acquisitions we've done, I have learned quite a bit. I have learned what to stay away from 
and what to uh, to gravitate toward. Um, it, I absolutely love, I always ask, you know, are they dropping off? Are they submitting through a portal? Mm. You know, that's a giant plus because that fits our model already. Uh, or are you meeting with the client for an hour, every single client, just to do their tax return? That doesn't really fit our model. Um, we would prefer get your documents, see what we're looking at, and then maybe give you a call and do a quick phone meeting about it, hear your questions, hear your concerns. Um, so I really analyze the processes. I analyze the, uh, the retiree or just, you know, the acquisition leader uh, and see what their tone is for a change and what, their, uh, what they've allowed their clients to, uh, what processes they've allowed their clients to create for them or they placated for them. You can usually tell pretty fast if they're a handholder and if they mm. bend over backwards for every single little thing. We love our clients, we wanna take care of them, but we also have lives as well. <laughs> so um, that does lead me into one more thing, and that's uh, just that tying back to that work-life balance that it has become a little bit generational, and I, I appreciate that, but I appreciate the modern times. We are uh, um, putting more emphasis on that as a culture, this work-life balance. But mm -hmm. through the acquisitions, sometimes these guys, they have, you know, they've worked their life away and I can see it and I can hear it in their tone and I can see it and how they take care of their clients or how the clients are just showing up all the time or calling all the time. So usually those are the ones I run from. Um, and we try to make sure that this, this retiree is, is happy with the relationship that he has. Um, yeah, it's pretty hands off. They drop their stuff off or they send it through this portal. I, I gravitate toward those and we try to get them as fast as we can. Interesting. Of your acquisitions, I, you said you've done four, is that right? Three offices and then four acquisitions. You, we've done three offices. So that's as far as the offices. Yes. But uh, I've done two more acquisitions because they merged into an existing office. Okay. Yep. Most people retiring from the practice when you acquire, or are you also buying so, firms and then they can. Yeah, it's most, you? most, I would, uh, okay. I always try to get the retiree to give me at least two tax seasons because you really just need it. The first tax season, it's a shock to every client. Yeah, I, It doesn't matter how old they are. They just, you can't retire. You can never retire. <laughs> That's the, they literally say that to them. Um, but if, if I can get two tax seasons out of them, that's a good deal for all of us and they can transition their way out. They can, they can uh, start to have a lower, uh, a smaller workload right away. And, and that's good for them. Uh, but then I have, uh, have done a few where they wanted to stick around for six, seven years. And that's great too. Good. Um, as long as, you know, it, they, they buy into the culture, they, they have to buy into the culture. And, and sometimes that can be difficult because they were a leader at their place and now they're not, or yeah. they, they have a different role and that's okay. As long as we can all get on the same page. So, um, it, it is good to have that person that sticks around for a while, as long as they're buying in. But occasionally that's how I'm going to get a CPA because at the moment, like we've talked about with the shortage ties back to it. So that's really been the easiest way to find somebody right now. Sure. I was just going to ask, how long do you, um, how long have you found to just kind of sit on the culture a little bit before you start implementing? Mm -hmm. Cause I know that, mm -hmm. you know, nobody likes their cheese moved. Right. Yep, and right. Um, CPAs are, are definitely creatures of habit, yeah. you know, in that instance. So how long have you found, I mean, do you usually say, Hey, like for the first six months, I just want to observe and then, like the next one, I'm just going to implement yeah. stuff. Do you kind of have a formula or kind of a thought process around yeah. that? I will definitely say each one's different. Cool. Um, I, I've come into some where I bought actually a satellite office and the leadership team was gone immediately. So obviously we had to get in, take over and do everything right away. Uh, others where they're sticking around and that's fine. And then time of the year matters on this as well, because if tax season's coming really quick, you got to get the action really quick. Um, mm -hmm. But you're right. I, I try to trickle the changes in, uh, get the important ones out of the way, get their data to our server, introduce them to the server. But I, I also want them to be introduced to the team on the server and, and feel like they're part of a bigger community, a bigger team as well. But other than that, we, we try to just one thing at a time. Uh, I don't have a period where I just sit and watch. Uh, I think they sold because they want out of that role and they need that alleviated right away. So uh, I, I do, you know, still act as the leader for that office, uh, me or one of my other staff, of course, or my other CPAs. 
um, we, we do need to step right in and be the leader of the office and, and keep that person as a uh, trusted advisor and consultant. And uh, I've been really fortunate that the ones that I've that I have bought out, they've bought in to our culture and um, to them selling it was a relief. You know, uh, what I've learned is that these things are their baby. You know, they sure. they created it. They worked it for 30 years, 40 years. Um, it is a difficult decision for them. But once they've done it, once the decision's made, once we're moving forward, it's a big relief. Okay, it's not all on me anymore. I'm not carrying the weight of everything. I have to make every decision. And they appreciate that. So I do try to re- alleviate that burden right away. Um, and then along the way, putting in our culture, bringing our, our team around once in a while, meeting them, and just, just slowly moving that needle forward. Corey, if we shift just a little bit, you, you mentioned you're on the cusp of advisory services. Got a couple questions around that, but we'd love to hear kind of what, what are you delivering? What does that look like? I think many of our listeners want to move to doing more advisory and probably mm-hmm. would learn a lot from someone who is saying, okay, I'm on the, the beginning of that. What's that I'm, look like for you guys sure. currently? Sure. I'm in the beginning of it to where we are researching mm-hmm. how that looks for our firm and how we can transition it. One of the, some of the battles that we fight, and you guys have already fought this, and I, I know that, and I, I appreciate knowing what you guys do. Um, one of the battles you fight is that the client expects that you should be doing that anyway for them and that you're already doing it. And for your $700, $800 tax return fee, whatever it is, well, everything should be included. I should get your entire brain and all your research sure. for that. So that's the struggle that we have is how do we bill for it? Um, and so that's we've we've tried to get feedback from some of our larger clients. Um, we've tried to uh, trickle this out a little bit and see how it would work. Um, we're we're going to need to tie ourselves up to probably some good software and, and and get a couple of my CPAs to really hard focus on it before we roll into it heavy and start putting it out as a as an option. Mm-hmm. Uh, recently, uh, I've gone into a metropolitan area and I feel like there will be more um, ability to grow that service there. And as we get into more cities, uh, we will have better success with that. Yeah, I I think what you would probably find is offering something new mm-hmm. uh, like forecast is one of the biggest pillars that we offer to people. Right. So right. I could see if you're talking to existing clients and say, hey, I've seen some things in your return that I could give you some advice. But if you really want us to walk with you in here, we could offer an ongoing service of continue looking forward in a forecast. Right. I think most of your clients would have a hard time saying, well, I would think I would get that for free anyway, right? That's a new service yeah. you're providing. And you may find you're going to attract newer clients may be easier than converting existing clients. Right. If they're really stuck on, I pay you $800 a year, maybe hearing that, you know, this whole package is going to cost you 50 or $60,000. They're going to, they're going to blanch at that, but right. you may have some right. to say, you know, I understood that or right. someone contacts you and says, my bookkeeper, someone left. Can you do some of these? That could be a right. perfect opening, but right. that, that'd be one advice is kind of what, what services could you provide? And I think it is different than just, I'm a smart guy who right. can give you advice. Right. And I think you're right that we uh, more new clients will will be up for that and will gain clients because of that. And then maybe once that's rolling, then current clients start to see, you know, this is a service that they're advertising and what's this all about? And then they call and then they get they get the deal and right. they understand it at that point. Um, but at this point, you know, they just they're calling two or three times a year randomly with a question. Right. And to them, that's their service and that should be included. And yeah. that's it. we do fight that. We do fight sure. the, the value of what we do to these clients as well. So, but I think, again, the metropolitan areas are going to, that's going to take off a little better there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I could see that. Yeah. I, I like that approach of doing that. You've got a big enough firm also. I think you're at a place where you could say I could devote a certain amount of resources to right. really growing that piece right. of the business. And as it grows, keep doing more and more. Right. Of that, but I, I think you will find that's really good. And it's interesting that people think it's included. We've done shows where we've <laughs> talked about we charge for this thing and then we give away the part that's free. Yeah. Often what you're giving right. away free is the best advice. That's the part you should be charging a lot for. Right. right. I really tried to, to to stand up for myself a little more even just this year. And and you know, I, I've been at this a long time now. I've got the education. This is what you're gonna pay me for. I don't I'm not just gonna answer questions on a whim. We're gonna do an actual process. We're gonna do some forecasting and some planning for you. Yeah. Do those so do you, are you charging stuff? hourly or yeah, sorry, Tom, are you, are no. you charging like have, what's your billing philosophy there at the mm-hmm. firm? Do you do fixed fee? Do you do mm-hmm. value based? Or are you doing hourly? So uh, value based is what I've always stood on. Um, 
taking it back to the acquisitions just a little bit, that can be a struggle because they're all used to something different. And so we that's another part of that changes process that we trickle in is getting everybody to a value-based billing. Uh, if that is a, a fixed fee for bookkeeping or whatever, but it still needs to be value. Uh, the tax returns needs to be value-based, not necessarily tying all the hours to it. Uh, I've, I've I've tried to kill hourly billing as much as possible. Um, Interesting. Basically, if I'm in, if I'm involved in a, with a lawsuit or something, that's about the only time I pull out the hourly billing. But uh, <laughs> other than that, we try to give a quote or we try to say, um, you know, this is this is how much we need to charge for this service based on what we're going to put into it. And we try to just be honest with them up front as best we can, and and create a good communication with our clients. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. good. What portion of your returns are value based? This is probably somewhat interesting to our listeners who probably do mm -hmm. a lot of hourly based. So what does that look like within you? For our returns, 100 uh, percent. Interesting. We okay. do not do hourly based at all for tax returns. Um, okay. Again, I have acquired some longstanding clients. And so mm -hmm. if their return didn't change much, I can't you know, change their fee too terribly much. Um, last year, we installed some minimums. Uh, just mm -hmm. to have some consistency across the board. Um, and being in a few different areas now, I've, I'm starting to see, okay, minimums might need to be different in different areas as well. Uh, but no, they're all value-based. Um, and, and our minimum's probably pretty low. Well, we had a 1040 minimum of 300. Um, but again, we're in some rural communities and I tried to make it consistent. And some of them from were stuck in some pretty low rates. So it... Sure. I, I would say um, w our experience with some of that um, too, Corey, was, um, and you can maybe appreciate this, is, yeah, we did the same thing. So it's just fixed mm -hmm. fee, right? Um, but the reason why we did that is, I don't know, we're we're close to like, I don't know, we're, we're approaching 15 million in revenue. Right. And right. we've only got like maybe a quarter of a million of that is standalone tax returns, right? right. That aren't right. part of our weekly fee. But we've always been just kind of, especially whenever we were smaller and scaling, we just couldn't afford for people to have, we couldn't right. afford to have accounts receivable. We couldn't wait right. for people to pay us. Uh, we didn't do the line of credit stuff, all that kind of thing. So we always tried to just get people to pay us in advance. Well, the nice thing about doing value-based billing is you can kind of take that power back. You know, right. So for us, what we started to do is like whenever we'd send them out, and I don't know if you still do it, you probably do it electronically now, but when yeah. we'd send them that electronic thing, we would make them send a check in or fill out an ACH form and it'd be mm -hmm. right on the back of the envelope, you know, check the box that you remember to oh, fill out yeah. your, your banking form. And, uh, and so, but the cool thing about that was, is we were able to send them out. So we always did like a three to 10% increase. And we would look at time the sure. next year to see sure. if we got exposed on a client and we'd reset rates for the following sure. year. Mm -hmm. We'd have them all on a list, send them out with an engagement letter with a dollar amount already sent in you know, so they could pay us, but we would send them a letter in November and say, Hey, well, we increased your price by 5%, but we'd say, Hey, you 5% discount. If you pay by November 15th, Oh you yeah, 2% discount, if you paid by December 15th right. and then no discount, if you paid after January right. or whatever, we got probably at one point, I don't know what it is these days. Cause we still kind of do the same thing, but <laughs> I think we got like 70% or 80% of our money before January. Right. Right. Wow. Uh, right. And I mean, and so we were, and yeah. we were never sending bills later. So right. when people dropped off, it was like, Hey, your check's not in here. Make sure you bring this back yeah. so we can get going on this. You know what yeah. I mean? So we always did that. And and I appreciate that with, with being um, upfront with the client and making it, it's, sometimes it's like a taboo conversation. Like we're not supposed to talk to them about how much they owe us. Uh, well, just, just make it something you talk about. Make sure that they know that they need to pay you for your services. And when, when I first started, I offered a, um, if they paid for a full year of bookkeeping, I would, this is the very beginning, I would take one month off. But if they paid up front, that's basically, uh, I think, an 8% discount. Um, and that was pretty popular. Uh, hmm. But I was growing very quickly and I needed cash, you know, up front. I need cash yeah. now to get this stuff done. Um, but that was good. And, and up to now, what we've really tried to move people to is just a monthly recurring, a monthly recurring ACH. And that's what we do mm -hmm. for our yeah. tax returns. That, we'll just break them down monthly. Yeah. And seems call to be that. convenient. Seems to be just, it works for everybody. Um, as long as their bank account information doesn't change or their credit card doesn't change ever, right? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> some upkeep on it. But, but no, that's, that's worked out really well for us lately. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, it that was always a good shift. Again, you could, by yeah. doing that value base, you can kind of pull that back. I know it scares some people. Like, what do yeah. you do if their stuff's way out of control? You can always hit the pause button. But I always equated it to, you know, whenever people would ask me, "Have you ever, ever been to a repair shop yeah. for your vehicle where they handed right. you the keys in an invoice?" Yeah, no, nope. never, <laughs> never. Nope. You paid, yeah. then they handed you the keys. Yeah, exactly. like that was kind of our philosophy in our office. Was like, there's, there's no terms. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like yep. we did the same know, thing, <laughs> and we'll give you a little bit of a break if you pay us in advance. But if not, you know, let's just get that out of the way right away. If you have right. a problem with that, you don't have to sign the engagement letter. You know, your right. fees twenty eight hundred right. bucks. I would get calls in November. Get it all squashed. And right. then we never had to worry about absolutely cost yeah. ever again. Right. And, and one thing, one thing I've even noticed lately is that um, there's so much work to be done um, that we don't have to put up with it. We right. we need to stand up for ourselves, and we need yes. to. Not, I'm not saying demand. I'm not saying be be rude about it, but you stand up for yourself. You're worth what you are asking. And right. if, if they don't want to engage with you, they can go somewhere else. And likely we had this happen when we put in our minimum, they went out and they looked, they came back. They realized, Oh, <laughs> interesting. That's still yeah. a really good fee. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, sometimes you want to like bill them away <laughs> yes. and yeah. you double, yeah. you double somebody's fee and they're just like, Oh, yeah. I guess. And you're <laughs> like, like, really? I'm like that's, <laughs> that's not what I was hoping your reaction yeah. would be. Sorry, like I can't kicking, afford it. You're kicking yourself because, oh, all this time, I bet they would have paid more. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yes. Right. Well, as we close this, Corey, if someone's listening saying, I love this idea of growing through the acquisitions, this multiple yeah. office, yeah. any one or two pieces of advice that you'd say, okay, well, here are the couple things you really have to think of to make sure that this is for you. Uh, yeah, I would. Uh, you really got to be hands on for a while. You have to get mm -hmm. in to that new office. So you, even if the the uh, retiree or the leader there is going to stick around for a while, you, you, there's a lot of work to be done for the transition. Mm -hmm. um, so you really got to plan on that, and you got to you got to physically be present. Um, so, you know, it, it's if there's a brick and mortar, that is, you know, if there's sure. not, that might be a different story. Um, but aside from that, get to know the people. The people are what matter. And you, you need to get in there and build that rapport, build that trust with them. And this, the support staff, the leader, those are what matter in the acquisition. Um, the clients, yes, of course, we want to take care of our clients. They're going to come. They're going to go. There's going to be people that leave just because you got acquired. And and they'll be rude about it, too. They will just say, I'm, mm. you know, we had one person in a small farm town say, I can't be bought and sold like cattle. I'm going somewhere else. I, okay. So yeah, I guess I didn't want to work with you anyway, yeah. but just be ready for that and don't don't take it to heart because it's going to happen just because people are people. <laughs> yeah. The other thing you mentioned that I think you would reinforce is it sounds like you've got a couple pillars that are saying this is what comes with us purchasing you, and it mm -hmm. sounds like your centralized database and the way that's yep. done is one of them. Yep. So up front, it sounded like that was an yep. early thing of saying, you know, yep. I'm sure to some extent you have your own culture, but there are certain ways that our firm does things, and all the offices right. do that. And it sounds like right. you've got some really good benefit out of that. And I've honed that along the way. That's what I've learned that I need to be, I need to stand up for. Uh, the first few, I had a, I had a, my first acquisition, excellent person, excellent man. I view him as a, as a mentor. Um, mm -hmm. I was lucky. Be, and he was lo local and close. So I was able to to work with him and really start to iron these things out. And he gave me a lot of advice. He gave me he had done some acquisitions in the past as well. So I really learned a lot from him and I've honed this process along the way. So you'll learn a lot after you do your first one. I bet. That sounds like fantastic advice. Yeah, great advice. Also a great, yep, great, a great advice. Place yep. For us to close. Corey, um, thank you very much. I, I, this has been a very enjoyable conversation as I knew that it would be. Appreciate it. Thank you guys so much for having yep. me. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Enjoy this podcast? Visit our website, summitcpa.net, to get more tips and strategy for achieving modern CPA firm success. We're here to be a resource in this ever-changing industry.